Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how can we build effective learning relationships with every student? And I'm in conversation with Kevin Hewitson. Hi, my name's Kevin Hewitson. Uh, I taught from 1977 up till about 10 years ago where I left the chalk face. Um, I now run uh, a small company called Advocating Creativity in Education. Uh, it's not specifically about the arts, it's about finding creative solutions to the problems teachers face. And through that, I've been able to contact teachers, work with students and teachers, research, get out and about, all those things you can't do when you're actually actively engaged in teaching. And the end result has been this year, has been the publication of my first book, uh, which is called, If You Can't Reach Them, You Can't Teach Them, Building Effective Learning Relationships, which is, I think, where we come in now. Absolutely. So the episode question for today, though I think we may go many different directions, but our starting point is, how can we build effective learning relationships with every student? So do you want to, to jump off there, tell us a little bit about your, your book and what's in it and why you think this matters? Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, when I was looking for a title for the book, you go around all sorts of things, don't you? Um, you know, I, I was really struggling to come up with something, uh, understanding learning needs and all sorts of things. And the, and the publisher said to me, well, what is it really about? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, the short answer is if you can't read them, you can't teach them. She said, that's it. You know, that, that's, that's the title because um, really that underpins everything we do as teachers. Uh, if we walk into the classroom and we haven't got a relationship with the pupils, then it's not going to work. Um, if it becomes a very one-sided dance, as it were, uh, you know, without a partner, and uh, the music's still playing, but you ain't getting any sort of relationship going, and there's going to be very little in the way of personal satisfaction for you as a teacher and learning taking place as a student. So that's how we came up with the uh, title, but it, it goes back, I suppose, further than that. When it, I mentioned that I stopped teaching about 10 years ago. Um, it wasn't a planned exit from teaching. It was more a case of, I think, the job or the teaching environment was going in one direction and I was very much pulling in the other direction. Um, I was trying to say, if you build the relationships first, the results will come. Um, the pressure was very much, and I understand the pressures and I understand the, the risk aversion, but the pressure was very much target driven and still is, uh, very much data orientated. And I think the, the sort of, um, I don't know, the challenge I think for teaching was then and still is, is to refocus on the learning relationship. Um, even though it might not initially produce the results you want, it will long-term. And the short-termism of education is, I think, uh, hindering its development. So that, that got me into an environment where I was no longer teaching. Um, and I wanted absolutely nothing to do with education ever again. <laughs> so that went it, well then, didn't it? <laughs> you know, paint a cross on the door and say, don't come anywhere near. Um, but I sort of met up with some people I'd worked with and they said to me, Kevin, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm making furniture. Uh, I've gone back to my roots. You know, I'm doing the, the things I really love doing. And I said, well, yeah, but what about all of those things you did with us? What about all the bit about building relationships with students and you know, the strategies in the classroom and all of that. What's happened to all of that? And I said, well, it's, it's sort of parked, I suppose. It's just sitting there. So after a couple of cups of coffee, they sort of, uh, I left thinking, well, should I do something about this? You know, should I, should I leave at least a marker somewhere? Um, so I, I spent an evening just downloading uh, on a keyboard, a really cathartic experience, really. You know, two years after leaving teaching, I'd managed, I suppose, to get my head back together I think you'd say that and uh, you know be begin to be able to put things into context and, and look at them objectively again so I downloaded this uh, this sort of thing overnight um, literally overnight my wife got up in the morning and said you still sat there and mm -hmm. yeah you know I'm still hitting the keys trying to sort of put things down um, and that then led to well why don't you do something with it you know because you know you've put it together why don't you do something with it so I thought, well, I'll have to find a narrative. I'll have to find a way of trying to explain this to people because that's always the, the problem. 
I mean, teaching is about telling stories. So teaching teachers must be about telling stories as well. Um, and so I thought, how, how do you find a narrative uh, where you can stand there very simply and say a few sentences, a few words, and people just go, yeah, I get you. You know, um, and it's not a quick fix. It's not a silver bullet. It's, it's a way of thinking. And that's what I wanted to try and tackle. So I, I set off reading, I suppose. Um, it started with a LinkedIn um, post where Mr. Gove <laughs> actually said, well, we need experts to be teachers. Uh, and all teachers have to be experts. And I thought, well, that's not actually true. So I posted that as a question. Um, about 400 replies later, um, I I'd sort of found like an, an alternative classroom to what I was used to. I had people coming in and dropping in comments and I'd blow back at them. And it was like working with a group of sixth formers doing A-levels. Uh, <laughs> he would say, well, have you read this? And what's your view on that? And somebody else would come back and say, well, have you read this? You know, and so it was a fantastic start. Um, I, I managed to bring a lot of that together um, in, into one presentation, which I shared, which I think is still up there somewhere. Um, on, on the old web. Um, and the answer was no, you know, you don't need to be an expert to be a teacher. You need other things. And that's one that, that's sort of, okay, what do we need? Uh, and what do pupils need to engage in learning? Well, lots of reading later and a, and a groaning bookshelf, I must admit. Um, I sort of, it started to sort of coalesce and I, I realized that I, I read a book by William Glasser uh, on choice theory, where he says, you know, all we do is behave. And that's just really sort of hit a chord with me. And okay, you know, well, what drives that behavior and our needs? And then you get into Maslow and, you know, you go through the hierarchy of needs. And you know, after we feel safe and secure and we've got shelter, then we start looking towards, you know, building relationships and self-actualization, et cetera. So I thought, okay, that there's something sitting in all of that. You know, what is it? You know, what what is the fundamental part of that? So I started reflecting on my own teaching again and the relationships I had. You know, when when some students, you know, it was always the naughty students who would want to be in my class. And so I thought, oh, you know, am I doing? Was I doing something different? You know, one occasion. <laughs> I had my students say, no, the register's wrong, sir. I, I am in your class. No, you're not. Go away. No, but I am. The <laughs> register's wrong. Um, and it, it culminated in a project which I had um, where I was given or asked to take on a number of students who were not doing so well in their normal curriculum. Mm -hmm. And at the end of year 10, there was about, uh, well, I was told 10 students were identified and, and their behavior was causing problems. It was disrupting the learning of others. And it was mainly in options um, because we have to stay with the core subjects. So, you know, the options were an issue. So I was asked if I'd take them on. And I think the phrase was, do my thing with them. Um, and so I said, yes. And I'll, I'll do it in a, in a sort of, almost as a research project, you know, an active research project. So I'll look at the data and I'll keep a track of things and we'll see how it goes at the end. That group from 10 turned to be 17. Oh. And um, the school was going through a, a rebuild and reorganization. We were going from a three tier to a tier two, two tier system on the same site. Uh, old classrooms had been abandoned and the building had been cut off from power and water, but the new building wasn't ready. And I got a classroom which had been just left. And if you've ever been into a school where the kids have left and the teachers have left, you realise the heart and soul just disappears. Yeah. It's a it, funny, funny feeling. Anyway, that's what I had. So I cobbled together some furniture. Um, <laughs> And the displays on the walls didn't exist, you can imagine. It was just the day after, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the energy had gone. So I met with these and um, they wouldn't speak to me. Uh, their self-esteem, you can imagine. They didn't know they were coming back to this. They didn't know what their new timetable was in year 11. Um, and they met me and they didn't want to speak to me. 
and I couldn't get through to them at all. It was a really stressful situation from my point of view, but it must have been from them as well. So we came to a sort of compromise where I didn't interrupt them and they didn't interrupt me. And I thought, well, at least we're in the same room together, that's a start. Um, we'll see where we can go from there. And every time I went in with anything that looked like work, like a piece of paper or a book, we're not writing, we're not doing this. You know, they've made it very clear that they weren't going to engage. So that's when I think my true teacher training started. <laughs> you know, <laughs> 30 years before when that was just leading up to this, you know, they were just uh, a precursor to, okay, you think you're a teacher, now prove it. One day I went in with some paper, blank paper. I was told they weren't going to do any writing. And I said, no, no, it's okay, we've got an agreement, you know, I understand. Um, but I've got something that I need to do, I can't just sit here and do anything. So I started making a uh, paper aeroplane. Now this is a, a, a style which my grandfather showed me. Um, and it takes about 30 minutes to make. It's not one of those quick three folds and you throw it across the room. Um, it involves, you know, origami, I suppose you would do classic as more than just a paper folding exercise. So I started this and one lad said to me, what are you doing, sir? So I said, well, I'm not, no, 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 we've got an agreement. You know, you do your thing, I do my thing. We don't have to be with each other. But what are you doing? I said, well, if you're interested, you can pull your chair up and have a watch. I'm not writing. Well, I don't think I've mentioned writing, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. So one came up and then another. And I said, well, do you want to have a go? Uh, I'll go back to the beginning. So I went back to the beginning. And I got a couple joining in and then I got them all joining in eventually. We all started making these paper aeroplanes. Now, I want you to imagine what happens when you've got 17 kids with paper aeroplanes in their hands. <laughs> they, they look at you and you look at them. And I say, well, what are you waiting for? What have you made them for? You know, let, let, have a go. So they started throwing these paper aeroplanes around in the classroom uh, with one eye on me waiting to get into trouble. And I didn't. I didn't pull them up at all. So one lad then stood on a stool, on a chair. Now I'm, I'm applauding this uh, internally because I'm thinking he's worked out the higher you stand, the further the aeroplane can go. Um, and he's looking to get into trouble. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I didn't say anything. So more stood on the chairs. Well, you know, he's going to go after this, don't you? After the chair, it's got to be the table, more height. Um, and these were all knackered desks and things, so didn't say anything about that. We got to the point eventually where I think they were thinking about the windowsill, and we're on the third story, so <laughs> I thought mm. that's not a good idea. Uh, let's go outside. Well, I was told quite plainly that they weren't going to be seen outside, throwing paper aeroplanes around. Um, so we snuck around the back of the sports hall, out of sight, and uh, I have a lovely photograph because I just happened to have a little digital camera in my pocket. And I learned that if you hold the camera up, suddenly you disappear. It's strange. If you hold <laughs> a camera up in front of a group of people who are not being, you stop being the teacher and you just disappear because their whole body language just changed the instant I held the camera up. And I have a lovely photograph of. 17 students lined up displaying every type of body language you could possibly think of from I'm excited and interested to oh, I don't really want to be seen here at all. Um, and we, we had us throwing around the paper aeroplanes. That was the breakthrough. That's, that's when I suddenly began to think, OK, there's a way we can get through to these kids. Now, let's see if I can take it any further. I was reading. Uh, and involved with some work with Barbara Prashny on uh, learning preferences at the time. And they did a, a learning styles analysis. And I know a lot of people are jumping up about learning styles and multiple intelligence and everything else. But a little aside, to me, it's a bit like um, the horoscope in a magazine. You open a magazine with a horoscope and put it on a table. I bet you'll get people talking about their horoscope. Yeah. So yes. learning stars, multiple intelligences, to me, it's a way of starting a conversation. And where it goes might not be specifically learning stars and things, but 
it's at least to start a conversation about learning, which we don't often do with pupils. We teach them, but we don't, I think, talk enough about the learning experience with them. Um, so I was doing that. That gave me a way in to start talking to them. And I realized then um, that there was quite a bit to this. So we got to the end, long story short, we got to the end. Their attendances had improved. Uh, their referrals for misbehavior had almost gone to zero. We had a working relationship. Um, we met for breakfast once a week. Um, they learned how to talk and eat at the same time. Some, a skill that they didn't have to start off with. Um, they even tidied up after themselves, which they didn't at the beginning. They learned all sorts of things and so did I. I was very proud of them as a group. Um, they had the, developed their own reward system. Um, they didn't quite meet their goal. And this was another thing that brought it home to me. We didn't get to Alton Towers. They didn't get enough points on their system to get to Alton Towers. But we had a fallback, which was to go bowling. So I took them bowling. And one of the kids said to me, can I bring along my friend? And I thought, whoa, no, this is you and me. This is our relationship. This is you know, what we've achieved together. And I, was, I said, I'll, I'll think about it. And I was talking in the staff room to a member of staff and this member of staff just said, you know, Kev, that's the best compliment they could pay you. I went, what? <laughs> they're willing to share their friendships with you mm. and I just sat back and thought wow actually that is quite profound isn't it you know we've got to the point now where uh, I wasn't an adversary anymore um I was somebody who they had a relationship with to the extent that they were wanting to share that um so I said yeah okay okay so yes yeah, so others came along and they were so well behaved it was embarrassing I mean, I'm there going, you know, in bowling, way, you know, I got a spike and they go, sir, sir, shh, sir, you're showing me up. And I, I almost had to give them permission to have fun. Oh. Um, and, and that was another sort of element. So you can imagine having stopped teaching, trying to put all of this into a narrative was particularly difficult. And that's when I came up with sort of understanding learning needs as, as a concept. Um, and then drilled down into that and, and got down to the fact, well, actually, it's fundamentally based on four needs uh, that drive our, our behavior for engagement. And funnily enough, it not only applies to pupils, it applies to everybody. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, so it, it's, a, it's a fundamental truth, I think we'd have to sort of call it. Um, and, and, then, and these four needs are, are what the book is all, all based on, really. It's at the core. Um, but I realized as a teacher, you don't teach in the vacuum. There's all sorts of things going on. There's all the politics. The, there is all of the procedures and practices and expectations in Oxted and you know, a whole bunch of things. So to get to the core, I felt as though I had to develop a narrative which took all those other things into account and, and almost give teachers permission yeah. to engage in this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, oh, I haven't got time. I'm stressed. Uh, I'm being told to do this. I've got too much on. Um, you know, the, the, the kids are. You know, the kids aren't what they used to be. The, the curriculum's moving fast, or you know, something's just changed again. Yeah. So, that was the hard part, I think. Try trying to to put it together so that teachers could buy into it and, and understand that I I too understood all the challenges and I too had also had similar experiences and more than that I found some solutions. I, so, I, so what are the four what are those four fundamental needs? Is this yeah. in PB PBCF? Yeah yeah which is power, belonging, choice and fun. Um, okay. Dead easy to remember please be child friendly. Ah. Right. Please be child friendly in what you teach, in how you teach, how you plan, and how you sort of engage with the students. So that was the you know the breakthrough moment, really. You know, how can you, you know, if you stand there and say, please be child friendly, nobody's going to say no. 
it's like raising standards, isn't it? <laughs> you know, driving up achievement. Nah. <laughs> we're going to drive up achievement. I think Ken Robinson said, it. have you ever heard anybody say, we're going to drive down achievement? Yeah. No, you haven't. So please be child friendly. Um, and then that reminds you to, to build into your teaching, your planning, your relationships, yeah. an element of power. So giving the students a voice, creating a sense of belonging, uh, giving uh, the options for choice, not free choice, but choice with consequences. And one of the biggest challenges for teachers is associating achievement with fun. Yeah. You know, and if you can do that, you crack it. Um, so yeah, PBCF, those are the four. So th the way the book is sort of structured is it, it starts off by saying, really, uh, to be your best as a teacher, you must be relaxed yet alert. And in, in martial arts, there's a thing called Zanshin, which sort of fits in quite nicely that, you know, and it, it's, it's also how I see teaching. You know, it, it's like the wise owl who's just per perched on the branch, watching what's going on, yeah? Uh, and knowing when to intervene, yeah? Not adding to the energy, guiding the energy, managing the energy in the classroom. So that, that first part of the book deals very much with, you know, where are you now? You know, and reflecting upon, um, I've got a little sort of exercise, come back a bit. It's a book, but it's more of a learning journey. Yeah, it's full of yeah. tasks and activities, isn't it? It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's the sort of thing I want, you know, people to sort of carry with them, you know, sort of have it, have in the bag so that they can, I've left plenty of space in there to scribble on. But all of the exercises are also downloadable as well. So you can print them off and carry it around and build your own journal if you want to. So you might want to yeah. do the exercises a couple of times. So start off with looking at where, where does your professional drive fit in a, in a matrix with anxiety? Yeah. And, and I found that was a really, I know there's complex ways of looking at motivation and engagement and everything else. Um, I mean, I've read a lot of the psychology behind it, but I wanted a simple tool. If you said to a teacher, look, there's, there's a grid, four squares, you know, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Uh, anxiety is on one scale and professional drives on the other scale. Where are you? You know, put a cross. Yeah. And then the next thing is circle where you want to be. And if the cross sits in the circle, brilliant. If it doesn't sit in the circle, then we've got some work to do. Yeah. yeah? Um, so that, that's the first part. So the, the, the book also looks at um, the environment which teachers, teachers work in. Yeah. And, and this very much comes down to uh, the environment leadership in the school creates. So we look at leadership. And um, <laughs> somebody said to me, I found my voice about leadership. The other day as I wrote an article for uh, for uh, an online magazine and uh, where I think our leaders in schools are far too compliant yeah. okay uh, <laughs> tell me more tell me more a bit contentious and what well I have this theory um, we return like salmon uh, to this to our where we feel comfortable to an environment where we feel comfortable and um, we do that as a profession in life um, or, or as a vocation in life. A lot of teachers were successful pupils. Yeah. Compliance is a key element of being successful in school. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. If your learning needs are being met by the school, that's great. Yeah. You're more likely to be compliant. You can be compliant and an underachiever as well, by the way. But anyway, um, as we go through life, then we face certain challenges. A lot of successful pupils will have gone on to further a higher education. Um, then what? What do we do? Some have a vocation and go straight to teaching. Some wander around in the wilderness for a few years and get a job as a manager at McDonald's or Beef Eater or wherever. And find their way into teaching. Um, I've met and I've, I've talked to uh, in teachers in initial teacher training. Uh, and one of my questions is why? 
why, why, why do you want to be a teacher? Um, you know, and if they're in their late 20s, early 30s, it's often, well, I remember what it was like to be a kid. I enjoyed school and, you know, I, I want to go back there. You know, I want to do my bit for other students. And the motives are perfectly sound. It's just that they're taking this compliant nature with them into teaching. And so when you get into leadership, you get told to do something. The directive comes from somewhere. It's a bit like, OK, how do we do this? Rather than, should we be doing this? Yeah. And I mentioned advocating creativity in education as being the sort of flagship for this, my philosophy, if you like. Yeah. You know, um, get creative. Yeah. I mean, I see learning as a problem solving activity. And as soon as we do, we bring into play a whole series of uh, strategies and tools we can apply. So, evaluation. If what I'm being asked to do, does it support the teaching and learning in my school? Yes or no? If it does, adopt it. Mm. Yeah, and make it personalized to you. Because we know one size doesn't fit all, and we need to contextualize it for our particular environment that we, we, our school is placed in. So, if it does, if it doesn't, what can I do about it? Can I deflect it? Can, can I modify it in some way and take the good bits out? Yeah. Uh, can, can I sort of just say, okay, we'll put that on the back burner and think about it. Get creative. So I, I see leadership in schools as a filter, and the filter is there to act as an umbrella to protect the teaching and learning relationship. So the book talks about that, yeah, rather contentiously, I suppose. But it's about mission statements, and not very many people actually understand what a mission statement is. Yeah? The minds do no harm. Yeah. yeah. So as a teacher, if what I'm asked to do, I think will cause harm to that teaching and learning relationship, I ain't going to do it. Mm. Yeah. And I know that's risky. And I know the cost. And I know that teachers have lost their um, careers. Yeah. And their positions in school, etc. And the first first reaction of Ofsted is often to move on the leadership team within the school because they're seeking instant uh, change and improvement. But I've also come across Ofsted inspectors and HMIs where I've argued my case and I've had the evidence. And very, I don't think ever that anybody's disagreed with me. It doesn't mean to say the outcome's not any, any better because <laughs> if, it's a, if it's a tick box situation, I remember being told, you know, you're doing all the right things in the right order, but there's no evidence, so I can't tick the box. Mm. But I said, we'll come back in 12 months. Well, I can't, I'm here now, I'm doing my inspection now. So, but then there's that honesty with yourself as well, I think, you know, can I sleep at night? Am I doing the right thing? Yeah. So the, the book looks at the leadership filter and I'm hoping that we can create a bit of a, um, a, a sort of supportive community around the book. That's the idea where people will share these stories and realize they're not alone. And I think the pandemic has been great, great for that. Yeah. I mean, I've been able to sit here and tune in <laughs> yeah. to so many conversations around, around the globe, really, um, where teachers are expressing the same desire, really. Absolutely. You know? and, and I think it's an interesting moment in time because I think that um, certainly from my point of view, the, it feels like the amount of schools and organisations who are interested um, in thinking about our students as more than kind of mini learning machines and thinking about the the whole child um, that seems to have really increased you know thinking more about their mental health their well-being their longer term outcomes and how we build strong adults from from these children which I think speaks to um, a, a lot of your philosophy but then there's you know behavior is quite a controversial uh, topic isn't it and it does really yeah. divide opinion and I'm I'm sure that yeah for every school that you're finding and every person you're finding who who buys into what you're doing there will be others who who sort of disagree and I know as we're talking today and um, there's quite a lot of uh, chat on on Twitter and social media about uh, our pal Gavin Williamson so our uh, <laughs> I mean, maybe I, I don't know if you mind giving a little bit of, of context for that maybe and a bit of your your thoughts on that just remembering some of the people listening in won't have a clue who Gavin Williamson is lucky them <laughs> yes our, our new secretary of state I say new uh I, I look actually looked the other day the average 
tenure of a secondary state is about a year and a half. Mm. Um, doesn't really speak to any sort of continuity or progression, and everybody seems to be looking for sound, sound bites. Um, and given that a lot of the secretaries of state are not professional educators, the thing that they base their own education, their own philosophy on is their own experience of education. I remember what I said about compliance. <laughs> um, and, you know, it worked for me, so they'll work for others. Um, I mean, um, oh, Nick Gibb <laughs> um, has a big influence in the Department for Education. Um, Minister, what's, what's his proper title now? Uh, Nick Gibbs' title. It's Minister for Education, but also... Minister for Education. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's been around a long time. He's yeah. been in that post about 10 years, I think, yeah. and has had a significant influence on everything from phon uh, phonetics, uh, you know, reading and, and our approach, and this idea of you know, uh, pupils will sit in rows facing the front, raise their hands when they get questions, they want a question of the teacher and things. All of those, which we refer to, don't we, Victorian uh, approaches yeah. to education, um, that, that they, they seem to be the driving force for education policy in, in yeah. schools. And behavior is always seen as compliance behavior. Um, in the book, I ask people, one of the tasks to go and find several their own start up with behavior policies in schools and just analyze it in terms of tone and how much of it is directed at learning behaviors and how much at compliant behaviors and my experience is it's normally compliant behaviors mm. we, we rarely look at and explore learning behaviors so the book is very clear about behavior it says and and this is the philosophy if we start to see behavior as a symptom of need, then we can address the need. Yeah. And that gets at the behaviors we want. Yeah? yeah. And those four needs really do show themselves quite clearly if we start looking at behavior in terms of symptom. Yeah. yeah? So when, when we haven't got a voice, when we don't, when we feel powerless in a situation. Yeah. How do we respond? How do we engage? I mean, if I asked you, Pookie, if I said, I want you to do this task, it's going to take six months, it's going to be you working 40 hours a week, um, and this is what I want, and this is how you're going to do it. I mean, how would you feel? Would you feel engaged? Would you feel I, I'd just say no, actually. Um... <laughs> you obviously weren't a compliance student. <laughs> Do you know, actually, I was, um, but I've learned in adulthood that that, that wasn't a good thing. I, I, I've spent a lot of my adult life saying yes to everything and trying to please people, and it doesn't do me any good. No, no. And it's, um, it's one of the things, it's interesting actually hearing you talk about the, yeah, compliance and whether it sets you in good stead. One of the things I often look at my own daughters who are, uh, they live in much easier circumstances than I grew up in, and I see that they're not always as compliant uh, particularly at school as I was and I look at them and I do often think you know, they're going to be great adults um, <laughs> and they might not be the easiest always getting them into school or getting them to do what I need them to do but actually I think I would employ them over the complying kid yes yes yeah yes um you know it's, it's not you know how hard you want me to jump it's why do you want me to jump <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah indeed you know, so, so you know looking at we start looking at behaviors and I, I, I take time to go through and sort of describe um you know, what it looks like in a classroom when students' needs aren't being met and, and how to identify the primary need. Because you can't differentiate, you can't sort of, you know, put behavior to one side and belonging and power and, and, and fun. You can, you, they're integrated, you know, one affects the other. But you can start seeing the primary needs. Um, and with that group of students I had, belonging, was, yeah. was the primary need, you know? Um, and once I got a relationship and I kept saying, I look forward to teaching them and they were my favorite group and, you know, what fun I had with them and everything else, you know, and what challenges I had with them. And I let them know I was being challenged as well. Um, once we got the belonging sorted out, 
um, even though, you know, they will come back and challenge you. Just when you think you've got it sorted, they just want to check. They just, it's just like a check, you know, are we still friends? I'll just push this this little bit. Are we still, yeah, okay, right, you know, you haven't gone to, you, you, haven't, you haven't left me or abandoned me type thing. I just need that reassurance. So you, you will get the challenges um, and you just smile as you, as you get the visits sort of thing. But once we start seeing that, that behavior um, and we, we take time to address or think about the symptoms rather than employing a sanction. Um, a sanction is like putting a blanket over a fire, I suppose. You can't see the fire, but it can burn through, mm -hmm. you know? And, and when it does burn through, it tends to come through with gusto. Yeah, you know, because you've just actually added fuel to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and, and that's what we see, I think, in the classroom. So coming back to behavior and, and how important it is, we want learning behaviors. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the focus. So stand at the classroom door and welcome your students. Get to know them and something about them. Uh, go out of your way to do it. Um, I mean, the school staff room is a superb place if they still exist. And I say if they still exist, because uh, you know, I've seen little mini micro satellite staff, uh, staff rooms set themselves up. You know, there's science teachers don't leave their little domain and the math teachers don't leave theirs. And the actual staff room itself is actually not that big enough anymore. It's not seen as an important part in the new school build. Um, but if you get to the staff room, you hear stories. You hear about kids, you get to learn about things that you, you never know when it might just come in handy. You know, um, I'm, I'm just smiling to myself because I, I remember I started a new school and I was given a year 11 tutor group um, who were a challenging group. And there's a couple of boys um, who every day, every registration, twice a day, uh, they were going to push it. They, they really want to, you know. But I was working with them and I had a girl in the group as well who was a carer. And I stood up for her with a couple of, in a couple of occasions, just said to the staff, you know, just give her a bit of space. She's dropping the kid off, you know, a brother off at the school up the road and they've changed their starting times and she can't quite get here on time and sometimes a bit late. Just cut her a bit of slack. So, you know, the old pastoral role, very important in schools, absolutely critical, especially if you're trying to build learning relationships. Yeah. Um, she let it known one day that uh, one of these boys had sort of pushed it a little bit with a girl and she sort of called his bluff and said, come on then, come on then, you know, if, if you want if you want to, come on. Uh, and she reached across and, and undid his belt and pulled his belt off and his trousers fell down. And at which point he legged it, you know, sort of, you know, she called his bluff and he, he so I, she let me know this on the quiet, just that this incident had happened. And so when this lad was giving me some stick, I just looked at him, stopped talking, just looked at him, said, your trousers falling down, do you, do you, do you need to tighten your belt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, the look. <laughs> <laughs> so you know building those relationships it, go out of your way get to know something about the kids yeah stand in the dinner queue walk around the playground um go on activities with them try and get you know if they're on work experience if, if they can get out that way these days um go and visit them you know you'll find a whole different side of the kids and you just never know when that could actually come useful in, in, a, in a situation in the classroom. So um, once, once you start looking at all of the behavioral symptoms, it becomes clear that there's only those four. There really is only those four. Um, and in the, in the, I've taken time to sort of explain why they're important. Yeah, what's the benefits you know, to you as a teacher and to the community and to the school of having those needs met. And I've, I've detailed those. Then I've sort of looked at, okay, how can we do that? How can we build those into our everyday teaching without adding to the workload? Which yeah? is crucial, yeah. Uh, which is crucial. And it's a mindset. Uh, there's, a, there's a lady called Ellen Langer, 
who wrote a book on mindful uh, learning uh, or mindful teaching and learning. And um, it's not mindfulness as we stay in the sort of medit meditative context, uh, being in the moment and things. It's being mindful of your relationship and your interactions with the pupils. What are they actually telling you? I mean, one of my mentors um, in, in the book is John's 12 Rules, right? And these are from John, my mentor, who never actually listed them as 12 rules. But when I did his eulogy after knowing him for 35 years, and unfortunately he died, I sat down and I realized he had, he had 12, 12 rules. And some of them were spoken occasionally, like, you know, work out what you want to know before you ask the question. Such a critical one. Great yeah. rule, yeah. Great rule, yeah. Um, you know, always ask the question to, to elicit the least number of responses. So not who's got a pen, but who hasn't got a pen. Mm -hmm. You know, simple little things like that. Um, anyway, I've almost lost my train of thought there, Perky. Sorry, I got, <laughs> went off with John's 12 rules. That's all right. I love the idea. John sounds like a great mentor. And uh, I think uh, it's, it's interesting often when you talk to people who have a, a great grip on what they're doing, often um, they have someone that they look to who's helped to, you know, help them find the way. And presumably you try to be the John to... Yes. I mean, I, I didn't realise at the time as well that uh, I was, a, I was you know, uh, absorbing. <laughs> yes. All, all of this. Uh, as I say, it wasn't until I sat down and wrote his 12 rules. Then I, then I realised it was the 13th rule. Oh. Uh, yeah, that. which was... When John died, he had about four lawnmowers and no grass. Oh. Right. So you think, hang on. And, and what it was, was if you didn't know what to do with something, you give it to John. <laughs> Right? which in a metaphorical sense, and what he really, was really what John was all about was turn nobody away. Right. Always help if you can. And I think that's a great rule for teaching. You know? I think, yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's just coming back to that mindful bit, which is where I lost my train of thought a second, Ellen Langham. Um, being mindful means that you actually pick up on all the little things. Yeah. John had a saying, um, never ignore, this wasn't one of his rules, but it was one of the things he said to me was, never ignore the red herring question. Okay. Uh, and I said, well, because you know, you, you're told, aren't you, that kids are trying to get you off track. And, yes. Yeah. You know, you've got to get more ignore. He said, no, they're letting you into their world. Okay. It's a, it's a little, little gap in the door, you know, it's a, it's a little glimmer into their world. If they're, if they're saying to you, uh, oh, is that like, you know, well, which football team do you support then, sir? You know, they're, they're thinking about that belonging again. Yeah. You know, what are they trying to do? They're possibly trying to bridge the gap between you and them. They may be trying to get you off the topic that they don't want to study. Well, <laughs> that's because you haven't linked fun to achievement. Yeah. Yeah. You see how they, they, they start yeah. 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 impacting yeah. each other. It's a very simple narrative, Pokey. But, you know, sit down with me for more than an hour. <laughs> you know, read, read the book. Yeah. <laughs> Look on the blog, you know. Um, you, you realize that it, it pervades everything we do if we allow it. And it's done without having to add to our workload. Yeah. When, when we plan lessons, if you ask many teachers, what should we put in the lesson planning headings? It'll be time, content, achievements, resources, etc. I'd advocate PBCF as well. Mm, mm, mm. How, how can I plan to meet belonging? How can I give pupils a choice and explain the benefits as well as the consequences of those choices? Yeah? Yeah. Um, you know, how, how, can I, uh, how can I really associate achievement with fun? How can I celebrate? At what point will I celebrate? How can I build that actually into my lesson in a way? And how can I signal it to the pupils that I'm chuffed, that I'm really yes. celebrating internally as well with what you've achieved? I, I, I remember having to stand in and teach business studies, which is not my subject. Um, and we were, go, we were doing marketing. Yeah. And I'd linked it to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. Um, 
and I didn't think it had gone in. And we had a we had an assembly where the, these year 11s had to sit and listen to, I think it was called Aim High or something. It was about going on to higher education anyway. Yeah. The, the idea was, you know, to promote going into university and what have you. And this group of kids, and, and one turned to me and said, he's talking about that thing we did, aren't we? And I said, what thing? You know, that thing with like the pyramid. Ah. <laughs> and I said, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And she said, yes, that's it. And I thought, well, at the time, three months ago, I thought I'd wasted my time. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I, I find that's often the case that this I, I found this often the student who I think is paying least attention is often. So I'll be usually going in to talk about, you know, something to do with mental health or something and be the one who's been fiddling with a pen or, you know, where you, you don't think that they're on on the same page at all. And they'll be the one who'll come up to you in the lunchtime and, and have a chat. And you'll realise that, yeah, it's really yeah. resonating. Yeah, but that comes back to the, can I just mention that there about you yeah. said about fiddling with a pen or doodling with a paper? If you start looking at what we expect, what, what are they, the myths about learning behaviours? Yeah, mm. sitting quietly, facing the front, paying attention. I just wish Gavin Williams was listening to this podcast. <laughs> um, you know, all of those things which are touted out, aren't they? Because yeah. they're seen as learning behaviours. They're not, they're not. I mean, have a look at Barbara Prashnik. She's got 12 learning myths as well. Mm. Um, and she, she spent ages sort of detailing all of these things that we, you know, we fight against in, in, as teachers. We're told to fight against, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and they're actually just preventing the kids engaging in the learning. Absolutely. Well, and, and this is a thing I find as a teacher of teachers is that um, when you hold teachers to account by their own standards of what they'd expect in their classroom, they're appalling learners. And it's yes. not about... <laughs> You know, when I'm teaching a room full of teachers, if every now and then I have to just say, OK, go on, just talk about it for a minute, because you can feel the energy bubbling up and they're whispering yeah. to each other and they're writing. That's great. If they really yeah. want to talk about the thing that I'm trying to teach. Fantastic. But it's not, I mean, you know, what we would expect. And when you try to bring them back on task and they want to carry on their conversations yes. again, yeah. you know. That's right. I mean, I, there's an exercise in the book specifically for that. Mm. Right. Mm. Uh, what, one of the I did a workshop. Um, and one of the things I did, um, these, these teachers, I was told, were struggling in building their relationship with their students. And that's often interpreted by the number of referrals, how many kids have stood outside the lesson. <laughs> 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 uh, and, and I thought, OK, then. So I went in and I put them into a learning situation. Right? So I had them sat and I give them a test. And what was worse, I give them a maths test. Uh, yes, yeah, so I can see. Oh. I mean, what subject do we all love? Um, I, th I think maths is phenomenal, actually. I think maths is great. And if we, if we taught maths as a language, we would get on a lot better. But that's another story. Um, so anyway, I, I get them into this mental state. And I, I get them in the beginning to actually mark how, how they feel on a piece of paper, their level of stress, anxiety, uh, enjoyment, and all that sort of thing. We keep that to one song, and we've had a jolly time up to them because I've been working hard to do the PBCF with them. Because yeah. please be child friendly is please be colleague friendly. Ah, uh, okay, good. Yeah. I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> Simple narrative, but ever so powerful. Um, so I get them into there. Then we, I, I tell them that it's going to be done. That they can't confer. Yeah, and it's going to be timed, and there's no talking, and then the papers go face down and they can't turn them over and they can't look and then we're going to start. So I create the absolute, you know, you can imagine the environment I've created. Yeah. yeah? Not one conducive to learning or to doing a, a learning yeah. challenge. They then start. So I'm then walking the room, walking around, pacing. And I'm saying eight minutes left, seven minutes left. You know, I sent this to a group of year sevens and they did it in four minutes. <laughs> and then you get the behaviors. Yeah. The pen goes down, you know, <laughs> the arms cross, the seat gets put. You see all of those behaviors that we mentioned, you know, about seeing them as symptoms of need. Yeah. Because I denied all their needs. I, I, I distanced them from each other. 
uh, destroy the sense of belonging. The, the relationship with me, I now become, you know, um, the, the aggressor, yeah. you know, in, in the situation. I've taken away all of their choices. I hadn't made it fun. And I've given them no options in terms of how they're going to tackle it. So we see all the behaviors. So at the end of that, stop, right, reflect on that. You know, now think about your students. You know, think about how they behave. Because you are going to mirror their behavior as well. Mm -hmm. If they're not relaxed, they're not comfortable, you are not going to be. You're not your best, they'll pick up on that. Yeah, yeah. the whole Zan Shin thing about being, you know, uh, relaxed yet alert in the classroom is so important. Absolutely. I love that. Um, yeah, that analogy with the martial arts. It's really strong, I think. And I, and I think there is something really powerful as an adult, putting yourself in the situation of, of learner and actually just stopping and, and considering what is it that we are expecting of our children all day, uh, every day. Um, one of my daughters has had um, past history of, sort of school based anxiety and, and avoidance. And having had all this time at home, it's it's been sort of re-triggered and it's been really challenging and when I've stopped and I've kind of thought about it and I thought I could not do particularly now having had all this period at home I could not do what we're expecting her to do every day it's un I think it's unreasonable what I'm expecting of her well, I can I can I did a little active research project where I followed a student around during the day mm. uh, he didn't quite know it. I was I was popping in and out of the class you know yeah. you can imagine and in secondary school so I saw I think five teachers that day wow Started off compliant, underachiever. Yeah. Mm. Sat there, did as he was told, um, didn't challenge, didn't ask questions, had learned as a little aside here again. Look at how many, how many, sorry, I'm going to have to get this out somehow. Reporting yeah. <laughs> in schools, what a waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> but there is so much information there if we use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the return on investment I think is very poor at the moment. It goes into a drawer, it goes into an envelope, it goes into a cupboard, wherever. I had a job once where I was in charge of assessment recording and reporting, and I was able to see the difference in behaviours of students across a range of subjects. And I, I then realised we students fall into three camps: right? compliant achievers, dead easy to write a report for, yeah, yeah? compliant. Sorry, non-compliant underachievers. Mm. That easy to write a report for. Yeah. yeah. Then there's the other bunch, mm. compliant underachievers. Who are they? What did they do? Mm. You know, um, it's very difficult to write reports for. So, you know, if, if we think about that uh, in terms of what's going through the school, in terms of abilities and, and uh, learning, achievement, etc. But you've got that whole bunch of, you've got kids who will withdraw internally. Their anxiety is so high that they just, you know, they don't engage. Yeah. But they're compliant on the outside. Yeah. yeah. Uh, up to a point. That's what happened with a student. Uh, we started off and, you know, this thing about a pen. Have you got a pen? Have you got a pen? seven times or five times during the day. Uh, he had a pen to start off with, uh, and he, he, he guarded that pen because he knew having a pen was a way of avoiding any sort of conflict or, mm -hmm. or uh, actions with the teacher. It got to the second to last lesson of the day. And bear in mind, he'd had a 10 minute break, 30 minute lunch time where he had on the hoop and had to get across the other side of the school. No, no movement between lessons, etc. The, the, the actual level of activity during the day was, was just was immense. Got to the last lesson, thought one, and somebody took his pen. Right. Got to the last lesson, teacher, have you got a pen? No. This was the thing he was not looking forward to at all. He got, he borrowed a pen, went through the whole rigmarole. You have to give the name, borrow a pen, and he turned to the end and he asked. Somebody else took that pen off him during the lesson. Mm. Oh. He stood up and thumped him. Oh. Yeah. End of his tether. Mm. Yeah. 
Mm. And the teacher, rightly so, had to deal with that as a behavioural incident. Of course. But we had actually created that. Yeah. From, from 8.30 in the morning, yeah. you could actually see, by following that student during the day, each little incremental step yeah. that was going to lead to either, you know, exiting from the, the environment, going home, you know, getting out the lesson, missing the lesson, around, or, it, or acting in some way or other. It was, it, was, it was something that made me really reflect on teaching and what we do in schools. Yeah, we expect a huge amount, don't we, from our students every day. Yeah. Yeah. What, I'm aware of the time, what, what thought would you like to close with, Kevin? What thought would you like to leave with people? I see behaviour, see the symptoms as a, as a need, yeah, and, and focus on the needs and, and reflect on PBCF, reflect on it in terms of your planning and your interactions with the students and with your colleagues and look at leadership in the school and, and, and try and work. If, if they aren't creating environments which is supporting your relationship with the pupils, which is causing you anxiety and stress, then start, start a conversation um, and talk about mission and talk about do no harm. Mm -hmm.